Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming and thank you to everyone who organized this. Um, this is a really exciting chance to be here. I think sometime right when I started uh, as a PhD student here at the history department at the University of Michigan was when we had uh, RonFest 1.0. It kind of kicked <laughs> off my experience as a graduate student here. And um, so I'm so grateful to have the chance to be here for this as well. Um, and the chance to introduce um, two of my personal favorite scholars. Um, but before that, I just want to kind of thank Ron for his mentorship over the years and his availability to students. Um, for me, Ron really exemplifies just uh, this ability to, at the same time, be really loyal to the archives and kind of the principles of the archives, but also think big, you know, and really bring us back to these important political questions that uh, make our work significant and important. And uh, yeah, as a student, I've really appreciated Ron's voice to kind of help us uh, maintain that dialectic between those things. So thank you so much, Ron. Um, I'm happy to introduce first uh, Jeff Ely, who's the Carl Port Distinguished Prof University Professor of Contemporary History here at the University of Michigan, and Golfo Alexopoulos, Professor and Director of USF Institute on Russia at the University of South Florida. So I'm not sure who wants to um, start us off, but um, Jeff? Yeah. Is this on? So, uh, well, I, I haven't done this for two years. I mean, literally. So I hope I've not forgotten how. <laughs> so um, I'm going to use my uh, time today to reflect a little on the intellectual history of the discipline of history over the last five decades and to locate Ron and his work on that broadly sketched map. And there are three strands to what I'm going to say that overlap and merge into each other. One concerns the genealogies of the so-called cultural turn. And a second concerns Ron's intellectual trajectory across that time. And then I'll close by uh, trying to align those two stories together. And uh, much of what I'll be saying actually grows out of uh, Don's, uh, um, many of Don's comments earlier t this morning. So I'm going to begin with a quick conspectus of Ron's intellectual passage from being a classically Marxist social historian, even though, as he pointed out, he was still learning what that actually meant. So his intellectual passage from uh, being a classically Marxist social historian for whom a heavily materialist conception of class was the principal orientation point, the lodestar, in fact, through a transitional encounter with political uh, science. I mean, this is very telescoped. Or more accurately, uh, a more ecumenical and eclectic uh, encounter with a far greater breadth of helpful concepts and methodologies in the social sciences involving anthropology and uh, sociology. So from there to the place he occupies now, which I'd call a very mobile and exploratory intellectual outlook and set of stances that includes a pretty open-ended repertoire of cultural histories and methodologies, including uh, the history of emotions. Now, interestingly, in my view, Ron's uh, sustained and cumulative encounter with what we came to call the cultural turn occurred to a great extent after that article after um, uh, his uh, Back and Beyond Reflection, which appeared in 2002, and must have been written, I guess, at the turn of the century. Uh, indeed, much of the lasting good that emerged from that vaunted cultural turn was only just getting started, in my view. For example, one of the most important stock-taking anthologies, Jay Cook's co-edited The Cultural Turn in US History, appeared only in 2007 from a conference that, occurred, that happened in uh, September 2005. Now, not only has much of the new history enabled by the cultural turn, as it was described uh, in the 1990s, properly materialized only long after the 2002 AHR forum that implicitly declared it closed. Not only that, though, 
but a great deal of the inspiration long predated that cultural turn in the 1970s and 1980s. In that sense, I think there were many cultural turns, and we each have our particular version. The important strand for me was uh, feminism, and, you know, in the 1970s now, whose challenge compelled changes at many different levels, although a long and complicated process was needed before these worked their way through my historical writing, and I think that of others too. Closely related was a re-theorizing of questions of ideology, consciousness, and subjectivity, partly inside the Marxist tradition, as it was then becoming, but increasingly breaking from it altogether, especially in the direction of psychoanalytic theory, theories of language, and a rich array of approaches to the study of culture, helping enormously with that uh, turmoil of uh, revision was the reception into the English-speaking world of the ideas of Gramsci. My best guide through all of those complexities uh, was the writings of Raymond Williams and Stuart Hall. And all of this intellectual ferment occurred during the later 1970s and early 1980s when social history was still very much the ascendant inspiration for the best in critical historical studies and the source of important new departures. I mean, that was the intellectual atmosphere in this department when I came in in uh, uh, autumn 79. We are all social historians now, was in that time the common discursive refrain. I mean, you heard it all the time in seminars and so on. Often followed by a but, okay, from those political and intellectual historians, but Really, that was the, the climate. Then, after a bunch of big splash polemical interventions, each by an earlier high-profile advocate of social history, Genovese, Stemon Jones, Jutt, Lawrence Stone, the discipline headed during the 1980s for a period of sustained controversy and often bitter disagreement, as it has already been mentioned this morning. By the middle of that decade, new approaches were crystallizing around gender theory, the Foucault reception, studies of sexuality, uh, new historical anthropologies, and what came to be called the linguistic turn. And the consequences coalesced under the umbrella of the new cultural history by the start of the 1990s. Now, this critical um, landscape opened up new interdisciplinary possibilities for research and exploration, merging history with anthropology, literary studies, communications and media studies, gender studies, uh, and a novel cross-disciplinary formation calling itself cultural studies. The very richness and diversity of those approaches, however, produced concerns among some as to where in these new culturalist accounts society still belonged. If all the world was a text, what could any longer be said about context, or in that earlier language, society? This in turn spawned a more fundamental conflicts. The very ground of the historical discipline itself seemed to many to be at risk. By turning to other disciplines and succumbing to their excitements, many feared, advocates of the new uh, fads undermined the integrity of historical knowledge itself, experimenting with other, other people's topics and techniques, what was now being called the cultural turn, brought the historian's epistemology into doubt. If some entered this fresh space with curiosity and excitement, in other words, others found only disorder. The AHR Forum, 2002, it's fair to say, was conceived in the midst of the, that ferment, which had been generating not only so much, curios so much curiosity, excitement and possibility, but also edginess, puzzlement, alienation and anger. So where was Ron in all this? As I already intimated, Ron began as a classic social historian of uh, 1970s vintage, joining one version of US social science history to the Marxist approaches associated with Thompson, Hobsbawm, uh, 
Rude and others in Britain. The Baku Commune was the apprenticeship, so to speak, but it was via the SSRC seminar series, I think, and the constant stream of high-level essays and articles of that time that he really staked out the territory. Above all, in that 1983 AHR article and its later uh, 1994 Russian Review Companion, Revision and Retreat in the Historiography of 1917, with those go the various essays on nationalism and class, the various conference volumes, and especially Making Work as Soviet that uh, Lewis talked about already in 1994. All of that clinched Ron's eminence um, in this particular capacity. And at that time, I think we would have, there were like, I think, you know, Sheila Fitzpatrick, I think, hit her stride a bit later, but there was Rosenberg, Zelnick, and Zuni. I mean, you know, those were the guys. Concurrently, um, he created virtually from scratch the field of Transcaucasian studies. He then built outwards to become a leading historian of nation forming and state building under the Soviet Union. He spent much time clarifying the role of uh, multi multinationality, processes of imperialism, and nation making in the shaping of state and society overall. And from there, along with Val, he also, he's also been shaping the comparative study of uh, the dialectics of empires and nations, both in Russia's empires and elsewhere. Intimately connected with all of those interests, of course, yet simultaneously a massive contribution in its own right is Ron's work on the genocide. And no one has done more to bring the Armenian genocide into the center of early 20th century European and Middle Eastern comparative understanding, not to speak of the wider field of comparative genocide studies. So, social history of the revolution, history of the Caucasus, wider study of nation forming and state building, dialectics of empire and nation, history of genocide, each of these huge areas lend uh, a unity to the career, but now more recently, he's been staking out his claims as a grand synthesizer. Along with the magisterial general histories, you know, the Soviet experiments and the Cambridge 20th century vol volume, we now have his remarkable Stalin, his essays in the two red flag volumes, a general history of the Armenian genocide, and a general book in the making on nationalism. So how should we bring these two stories together? Okay, so the historiography uh, in the d disciplinary and professional sense, general sense, and Ron, in those particularities that I've just been going through. How should we bring these two stories together? Well, Ron's trajectory both follows and shapes the broad intellectual trends I've been describing. His work has flourished, I mean, not only inside his own field, but I think for people in other fields who are animated by an interest in the topics that Ron has covered. I mean, Ron is the go-to person, you know, to, you know, now to educate oneself in uh, Soviet history and all of those uh, uh, cognate questions. So his trajectory both follows and shapes you know, uh, is produced by and then further produces the broad intellectual trends I've been describing. His work has flourished since the 1980s by being in direct conversation, continuous conversation with those wider intellectual trends, but has also reflected back on them with vital contributions to their general understanding, not just in the essays commenting formally on those general trends, but in his wider corpus of monographic and critical historiographical writing. Ron's work has been produced very much out of those trends while further producing their interest and importance. Ron's work tracks the main passage during the past few decades from the social to the cultural and thence to a critical practice that does far more than simply combine them both, like adding them together, but rather defines a new hybridized space of imaginative work somewhere quite beyond. Ron's writings offer a, a series of snapshots of a, of a discipline continuously rethinking its charge. 
its varieties of approaches, its expanding subject matters, its relationship to theory and other disciplines, its place in the public culture, and its importance for politics. If changes have always been fought over, often very divisively, then the later 20th century uh, brought historians radically new possibilities. Powered by Marxism and other materialist sociologies, the great social history wave instated the value of social explanation. And then, as has already been, uh, as Lewis already pointed out, almost immediately, the cultural turn upset many of these freshly earned certainties. Feminism, gender history, reception of Gramsci and Foucault, cultural studies, historical anthropologies, histories of sexuality, critical race studies, post-coloniality, history and memory, the new imperial histories, global and transnational history, and on and on, many other departures. All of this flux changed how historians are now challenged to think. It's a completely different world intellectually from the one that we entered, you know, however many years, 50 years ago, right? Ron's, since at least the mid-1990s, Ron's multifarious works have been an active engagement with these consequences. How might we understand the social and the cultural together? How do we collaborate most fruitfully across disciplines? If we take feminist theory, post foucauldian analysis, post-colonial studies, or any other body of thought, seriously, how does that change what historians do? If we do the same for race, imperialism, and the global, if we think with the category of empire and try to bring the empire home, how does that remake... What's going on? How does that remake national histories. If we take empire seriously, how does that remake national histories? Okay, so uh, that the paragraph that I just reached the end of began um, by saying that Ron's writings offer a series of snapshots of a discipline continuously rethinking its charge. And then I went on and I ended that paragraph with some questions. Um, how might we understand the social and the cultural together? Um, how do we collaborate most, most fruitfully across disciplines? If we take all of that theory seriously, um, how does it change what historians do? Um, and in particular, if we, if we take uh, race, imperialism, and the global, seriously, if we think with the category of empire and try to bring the empire home, how does that remake national histories? How should we think differently about politics? Okay, and now I'll resume. And here runs Chicago interruption, <laughs> as I like to think of it. And before that, the inception and experience of CSST, along with the MSU Soviet Working Class Conference, and the collaborative process of putting Becoming National together. That Chicago interruption, along with those other things, opens a window onto another vital aspect of how history has changed since the 1970s, and that's its necessary and pretty inescapable interdisciplinarity. History uh, can never be self-sufficient. To be effective, it always needs other disciplines. And that being said, though, what remains distinctive about history's knowledge, history's uh, epistemologies? How has that shifted during recent decades? How do historians come up with their questions what are the complexities in the relationship of history to memory and memory publics? How does history relate to the public and private worlds of politics? Whether in his immediate Soviet work, in his Caucas Caucasus corpus, in the landscape changing engagement with genocide, in his continuous wrestling with nationalism, Ron's entire oeuvre show the complicated um, interconnectedness 
of historiography, theory, the personal, and the political. In one vital dimension, his writings are a series of critical intellectual histories of particular areas of historiographical change. History's changing overall place among the disciplines, the structuredness, creativities, and contingencies of nation making, the back and forth relationship between social histories of class formation and possible bases of politics, the constraints and transformative consequences of the new imperial histories. In the excellence of his immediate practice, Ron challenges, challenges us with the most important questions of the discipline. If historians take seriously powerful and exciting developments in theory or in other disciplines or in fields other than their own, how does that change how they think and what they do? How did we come to think what we think? And how were the changes and departures enabled? And I don't have time to do it here. This is my last sentence. But a really admiring, critically affirming assessment of Ron's historiographical trajectory and contribution could take his closing essay to Red Flag Unfurled his title is Breaking Eggs, Making Omelets, Violence and Terror in Russia's Civil Wars, and read it not only as a statement of culinary pleasure, but as a demonstration of a masterful, discipline transcendent, theoretically informed historian at the peak of his game. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was fantastic. Um, now I'd like to invite Golfo to um, give her a talk. Yes, thank you. And you. thank you. Oh, you can. Oh, you can. Hello? Now I can. Hello? Yeah. OK. Now we can hear you. Great. So it's wonderful to be here. I was also at RonFest 1, and I wish I were there present with you for RonFest 2. But um, it's a great honor. To, uh, to present today. So I was asked to describe the influence of Ron's back and beyond on my own work. So as a student of Ron's during uh, Ron Suny's Chicago interruption at the University of Chicago, I was taught to pay attention to the language of my sources, who was speaking and to whom, how audiences determined messages and the importance of excavating the layers of meaning from individual petitions, testimonies, official documents, and memoirs. I was taught that culture matters. In writing Stalin's Outcasts, Alien Citizens and the Soviet State, and meticulously transcribing 500 handwritten letters and petitions, I became aware of the power and resonances of particular words and phrases and of how one letter or story or testimony didn't become legible until it could be examined alongside another and another. Ron taught me to, as he writes here, insist on the historically and the culturally specific constructions of understanding and feeling. And so, when examining citizenship in the early Soviet state and the lines between bourgeois aliens and proletarian citizens, there was no timeless decontextualized ahistorical character to these frameworks, no economic archetypal bourgeoisie or proletariat, but rather Soviet citizens and non-citizens were, as Ron himself writes, historical constructions made by human actors who are in turn reconstituted by the very products of their making. Culturalists like Ron, and as he himself writes, deeply suspect hard, fixed, essential social categories, class, nation, gender, and proposed considering a more radical understanding of identities as fluid, multiple, fragmented, and constantly in need of hard work to sustain. This had a profound impact on my own work. <clears throat> 
Every national community identifies its members and aliens, but the Bolsheviks defined their new polity in an expansive and transnational way. Rejecting residency, ethnicity, and language, the criteria of citizenship in bourgeois nation states, they defined the Soviet polity along class lines as a political community of the world proletariat. The full rights of membership in the Soviet in Soviet Russia's great laboring family was reserved for member for persons considered proletariat, whereas the bourgeois classes represented Soviet outcasts or aliens. Lenin's 1918 constitution outlined the general categories of people marked for disenfranchisement, but law couldn't fully capture what was who was vulnerable to the loss of rights and who would be considered worthy of citizenship. The Communist Party leadership determined bourgeois and proletarian identities according to such indicators as social position, current social position, former social position, uh, parents' social status, and genealogy. A, the personal questionnaire or enqueta in the dossiers of some outcasts or licensi highlights the importance that party officials placed on certain indicators of identity, former estate, Saslovia, profession and place of employment at various moments, 1917 to 1919, 1919 to the present and so on. Income before 1917, before 1922, since 1922, material possessions and property, service in the Imperial Army, in the Red Army, in the White Army, trips abroad and the reason for foreign travel, past arrests, one's level of education, plus membership in a trade union or political party. For the Bolsheviks, the answer to these questions could determine a person's proletarian status and predict their loyalty to the regime, which is why officials took exceptional interest in the biographical minutia of Soviet Russia's population. But as Ron, Ron's work teaches us, one has to look beyond, beyond the Anketa, beyond the 1918 constitution, beyond the legal categories of bourgeois and proletariat to consider the boundaries of the Soviet polity. The laws on disenfranchisement and the formal markers of citizens and outcasts were given life through everyday practices of classifying bourgeois enemies and proletarian citizens. Insiders and outsiders were defined not simply in formal class terms, but in accordance with the attributes, sentiments, experiences and behaviors that in a particular historical moment of the 1926 to 36, which I examined, became synonymous with class. Ron's work taught me that cultural meanings and assumptions determined class ascriptions in fundamental ways. The highly pejorative term bourgeois could express various meanings for the participants of the Russian Revolution, including foreigner and outsider, Jew, heartless and corrupt boss, speculative trader, and parasite. Somebody who is bourgeois or bourgeoisie was understood to profit from someone else's suffering. They could be deceitful, greedy, rude, and arrogant, well-dressed, articulate, and even chauvinistic. People were disenfranchised as bourgeois elements uh, for insulting Soviet officials or a well-connected neighbor, for renting out space in a modest dwelling. Cultural understandings of, of the bourgeoisie effectively broadened the field of aliens to include social deviants, marginals, including prostitutes, gamblers, the infirm and the elderly, tax evaders, embezzlers, and ethnic minorities. In the words of one Soviet official, the most diverse mix of people for the most varied reasons is being disenfranchised or deprived of citizenship. 
Indeed, those without rights did not represent a uniform segment of society, but included the elderly and the disabled, as well as the young and able-bodied, women who earned paltry sums and odd jobs, white army officers with formal education, and Buddhist monks without, Russian peasants alongside ethnic traders. There was a degree of randomness and bad luck that was certainly at play here, but disenfranchisement was not entirely haphazard. What I discovered is that exclusionary practices contained distinct patterns. The categories of bourgeois proletarian evoked particular meanings of the non-laboring parasitic and exploitative elements and the laboring destitute all suffering souls who experienced hardship and exploitation. The identities and attributes of those who belonged to the Soviet polity and those who were not were informed by cultural understandings of bourgeois aliens and proletarian citizens. Social life, hardship, exploitation, misfortune, and emotional and personal attributes, sincerity, remorse, duplicity, often determined membership in the new Soviet polity. Practices of the deprivation and denial of rights and the reinstatement, restoration of rights, these, re these practices revealed the social cultural interpretations and meanings of the Bolsheviks class-based political community. Ron taught me to turn towards the discursive, linguistic and cultural elements of my sources without losing sight of the empirical grounding, the material and the social. Lichensi weren't just constructed, Lichensi were not just constructing emotionally charged laments. They were in fact unemployed, living at the margins of society and choosing various strategies, linguistic and performative, but also communal and experiential to earn their way back into society to get their rights restored. Ron's influence on my work did not end with this book, which was based on a dissertation that like all dissertations was written in many ways collectively through multi a multitude of scheduled and unscheduled conversations, whether in Hyde Park, Chicago, in Moscow or elsewhere. I went on to write another book, Illness and Inhumanity in Stalin's Gulag, which examines Stalin's vast forced labor camp system through the lens of health and medicine. As I poured over the documents of the Gulag's medical sanitation department, I was haunted by the language and discourse of the camps. Labor camp prisoners were human raw material, Chalavyechiski Sirio. The prisoner was a commodity, Tavar. I was studying health in the Gulag, but the word health, Zdarovye, almost never appeared in Gulag records. I was studying people, but the words for people, Ludzi, never appeared. Neither did the word for life, Jizen, or the word for death, Smirt. Rather, camp officials spoke not of people's life and health, but of their physical labor capability, trudospasobnost, or labor utilization, trudavoy ispolzavanya. Illness was recorded as lost labor days, mortality as labor losses. The Stalinist camps considered sick and emaciated inmates defective, inferior, ballast to be discarded, and they demonstrated concern for prisoners' illness and mortality only as these related to lost labor, through the pazieri. So I was struck by the distinct, I was so struck by the distinct conceptual universe of the camps that I organized the chapters around the language to underscore the culture that makes atrocity possible that enables mass violence. It was Ron that taught me to understand institutions like citizenship and forced labor 
let me say that again. It was Ron that, um, that taught me that to understand institutions like citizenship and forced labor, I had to listen deeply to the languages of my subjects, whether the lamenting language of the disenfranchised peasant or the chilling discourse of the gulag official. For that, I thank you, Ron. So thank you, Jeff and Golfo, for those great talks. Um, uh, I guess I wanted to kick us off by uh, bringing another um, text to the conversation here, which is um, an essay from Bill Sewell's Logics of History. Um, the, the title is something like Confessions of a Former Social Historian. Uh, and he brings up in this essay, um, uh, you know, from a, from a point of view, obviously, sympathetic toward cultural history, that uh, the cultural churn coincides with a neoliberal turn politically, uh, and that there's a kind of turning away from questions of class politics uh, at, at the same time that sort of rate of concentration of wealth is increasing. Um, and that this is um, something we can kind of reflect on, right? That the, this kind of basic message of social history um, that uh, maybe does, does need to be brought to bear here. Um, and so my question, I guess, is, um, you know, given that I think Golfo's work does such a, a fantastic job of showing how um, class as an analytic ca category uh, needs to be constructed, right? And that it's, uh, we need to be very careful not to reify a notion of class that is, um, you know, lacks dialectics, essentially. Um, uh, on the other hand, Jeff's work really shows that this particular idea of class was very powerful in forming the political institutions of democracy in, uh, in the West. So I guess as a question to all of you, how do you understand this kind of uh, coincidence of the, the cultural, the linguistic churn, and uh, you know, what David Harvey calls the restoration of class power uh, after the 80s? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, it's too gross. It's basically, that's too gross a question. OK? <laughs> I mean, you have, it has to be, it, it has to be, there has to be a more exact historicizing of how these, these, these intellectual, these shifts in the intellectual landscape of a discipline occur, right? I mean, I obviously have the same gross, gross question in mind when I wrote that Crooked Line book and, and, and elsewhere, but I don't think we, get very far, you know, in, in Bill's uh, um, uh, response, you know, there was a forum in the AHR around that crooked line book, and in Bill's response in that forum, there's a remarkably unself-conscious reductionism, okay, that, exp that, you know, that sort of explains the rise of social history in terms of Fordism. I mean, he does it more sophisticatedly than that, but that's what's going on in the logic of the argument. So that then the cultural turn and the vacation of a ground of class analysis and of those social history um, orientation points becomes like an expression of neoliberalism. I mean, come on. It's really much, the, the demands of making that argument are much more exacting. I mean, and we all know, you know, we obviously, when we're doing our historical work, we're constantly in conversation back and forth with the stuff going on around us, right? But doing, you know, the kind of careful intellectual history that makes it possible to establish explanatory relations between, say, big events and log or and or large processes, and you know what happens in a seminar room, or when somebody's writing a book. I think that's really complicated. And uh, it, it, it uh, I mean, maybe I'm doing him an injustice, but you know, go look at that that response to the Crooked Line book, and then my rejoinder, and see, you know, so that so I, I'm I'm fascinated by the relationship between. Um, politics and the kind of history we write, right? Uh, but, to, but to do that well is actually quite, you know, it involves a lot of work rather than just 
just sort of saying, well, you know, we can blame cultural historians for neoliberalism. <laughs> and I know you're not saying that. Obviously. Oh, of course not, no. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I agree, I, I, but I, I find myself uh, continually troubled by the question, I guess. Yeah, well, we were troubled, I think, when we were social historians, too. You know? <laughs> uh, I mean, they're, they're troubling questions. You know, they're, they're very hard questions. You know? and, I, and I think making that alignment, that, uh, you know, to use the, the phrase that, 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 that I used in, in, the, in the talk, making that alignment is actually pretty hard. You know, because we bring to that question a ton of assumptions about what we think we remember. You know, what we are told in the meantime that we remember. Well, actually, the histories among, you know, most of, most of what we think happened in the late 60s, you know, happens in the 70s, to use a very, you know, often cited example. Sorry, I probably talked too long. Uh, Ron or Golfo, do you want to? Golfo. No, I think that's a really good question. And I wonder whether it was uh, there was a deliberate desire to stay out of uh, politics at that time. Um, but I I would like Ron to speak to this because I, um, yeah, could Ron, Ron go first and then, um, yeah. I'm not sure I actually understood the question so well, but I wanted to, I'll say a word or two about class. Class is a very, fraught and difficult concept, uh, especially for people who take Marxism seriously. And the, 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 uh, the literature on it is enormous, right? And, uh, and it's also a, an effaced concept. So it's pushed out of a lot of American historical discourse. And it's replaced by other things like gender and race. And it seems to me, uh, in a very naive way, you can't deal with gender and race without ideas of social hierarchies and differentials of power. That they're incredibly, to use one of Jeff's words, uh, complexly imbricated one with the other. I learned that word from him years ago. <laughs> I had to look it up, like a lot of words. Um, you know, but uh, it, it seems to me that not to talk about those things or to reduce one to the other are equally uh, mistaken approaches. So uh, you've got to think about those things and see how they, they uh, you know, intersect. Uh, I'm very interested, there's a book years ago, which is a very good book, so it's a sociology book, I think. You'll tell me who the author is, Miguel, uh, called The Hidden Injuries of Class. So in American society, they don't even recognize class, and yet people are being hurt by it. Senate. Senate, right? Uh, Robert, Richard, Richard Senate. Senate. Richard yeah. Senate, yeah. Fantastic book. You know, I read it so long ago. Uh, what are the feelings? What are the affective uh, aspects of class that are often not recognized and yet are really hurting people and leading uh, uh, to the kinds of outbursts, particularly on the right, of a disaffected, this interesting term, working class that now is not the proletariat that we all dreamed of, but now you know, moving to the right, et cetera. So it seems to me these are very complex issues. And, and I'm going to make a plea here. History, Jeff said, is not a self-sufficient field, right? History is central. History is absolutely essential. Because what is the database for understanding how we ever got here and where we might go? What are the possibilities for human action in the future? You know, only from history, that's the complex and unapproachable, and inapproachable some way, database that we have. And the second thing is, and I think this is central to what our department at Michigan is so good at, uh, because it is a left-wing department. I, don't publish that. Uh, <laughs> and what Jeff and, and so many in this room do uh, is we practice history as a subversive science. That is, the main thing is to undermine uh, unexamined, hegemonic understandings. And that's so much fun. And I tell the group, you will just always enjoy that. You'll get, again, a galvanic skin response from trying to do that. Uh, and I think that's what Michigan has been good about ever since we got here. Um, it's a, a unique department 
And the concept of class would be central to this, as is race at the moment. It's a unique department where the empirical and the theoretical are working together. I came from Oberlin College. OK, I came here first in 1977, then as a full faculty member in 1981, when history was totally empirical. There was no theory in history. There were no courses in theory or whatever. So this is not sociology or anthropology. We didn't do it. And the only theory we had was a kind of primitive understanding of Marxism. That was the theory, right? And you came to Michigan, and suddenly theory was in the air. There was CSSH, the journal. Uh, people were answering interesting questions, et cetera. And then we went through the social history turn, which you had to defend, and the cultural turn, et cetera. And that happened here. I went to Chicago, OK, my exile in Chicago. And when I went there, in political science, and wrote a book, which they're going to discuss later, The Revenge of the Past, it was an attempt to bring history into the study of class and nationality in the Russian experience. And interestingly enough, my students, Golfo, maybe you remember this, maybe not, uh, were a theoretical. That is, I love Sheila Fitzpatrick. I learned so much from her. She's a great, she's a kind of pointillist historian. She's like, you know, Serrat or someone. She, the, all the data is there. She's an archive rat. She brings it out. She has the real zitzfleisch to sit in those dull archives without lighting uh, and work. But in terms of, of generating a kind of more theoretical understandings, like, say, Moisha Levine, who was my, my own uh, mentor in a way. I call myself a Marxist Levinist, right? Uh, all, all, you know, that was not in the atmosphere. And I would try to bring into those discussions in our wonderful workshops some of these theoretical things. Uh, and they were sometimes dismissed. Oh, well, you know, he's a Marxist. We'll just put that aside. But I think something came out of it. It's indicated in your remarks. Your turn. Well, I, I do think that um, I, I wonder, Ron, whether you would agree that because the field was just, it, it was so, there, there were so many like really lively, significant debates in the 80s. And it seems that with the collapse of the Soviet Union or kind of the end of history, something just happened in, in our field. And I, maybe I'm wrong, but I do think, you know, to get, to get back to the main question, why did we actually move away from being really engaged with politics? I mean, this is like the Clinton era, the end of history. I, I think a, there was a certain timidity, I think, about engaging with a lot of these um, economic issues. I, I, I mean, I say this because I just finished reading Fiona Hill's book where, you know, she describes this, this time when Thatcherism, Reaganism, and the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, created these forces within all three countries that, that um, spawned populist reactions. And now we're wondering, like, what happened all of a sudden? But it, but it had its origins in that era. And yet we weren't talking about it. We weren't engaging with that material so much about you know, income inequality and um, economic displacement. I don't know, is, is that too, is that unfair? Um, Thank you. Um, I think we're gonna take a question from the audience. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I came to uh, Michigan in 88, and that's when we started collaborating. So I was in graduate school during the 80s. But I think a very important dimension uh, is uh, sort of the insight one has uh, through feminist theory, especially uh, in terms of critical self-reflexivity. I think that is sort of what differentiates uh, critical theories uh, that uh, look and take seriously into the intersection with gender and sexuality in a way to bring what, where one is located oneself as a scholar in the field at large and how that generates income uh, inequalities that you can then map onto or converse with the larger structural inequalities. I think that turn is not something that historians engaged in very early on. 
and I think anthropologists did, and that probably is the difference, and humanities did too, and I see there a, lap, a lag uh, in history, at least during the 80s and in 90s, I think, historians started to change. I wonder what you think of that assessment. Thank you. Thanks. Um, does anyone have a burning desire to respond to that first? Well, I think it's a, a misdescription of, um, of the periodization involved. I mean, after all, you know, if we take, you know, the, like the, the, um, the sort of, uh, I'm looking to the right, the crucible, the crucible of in, interdisciplinarity here in the, uh, from the later 80s through the 90s was this, uh, this program in the Comparative Study of Social Transformation, CSST, that one or two of us have mentioned already. 20 of the 30 original members of that group were historians, okay? This is already a department when I came that took theory and interdisciplinary resources really seriously. It was just a social science uh, interdisciplinarity rather than a cultural studies kind that kind of, you know, became so uh, hegemonic in, in the course of the 1990s. So it was Tilly. I mean, you know, when I came to, came to this department, it, it was a social science history that, that included Bill Sewell himself uh, slight, slightly earlier. I mean, not here, but in his earlier incarnation. So I think historians were conscious of theory. You only have to look at past and present and anal and uh, CSSH in the course of the 1970s, and it's already happening very early on. Not everybody, and I think Ron is right to say that, that you know, historians were theory-averse you know, in terms of the prevailing culture, but that didn't mean that, you know, I mean, uh, historians weren't all Marxists either, but, you know, the, in terms of those grounds from which really uh, important radical innovation was occurring were, were, were already in, interdisciplinary before we get into the later 1980s. Yeah, um, can we, can she have the mic again? You, you know, you've uh, uh, been so kind, all of you, of, of t saying how wonderful my work is and all, and I love that. Uh, we can go on for a week if you like. It's okay with me. But, you know, there are lacunae, there are, are uh, blind spots, and one of the blind spots is, for me, was feminism. Even though I had a wonderful wife who was an early feminist who would not take uh, my name, last name, and so forth. And she taught me things, you know. Uh, one time at Oberlin, I was teaching a course called The Left in Europe. And uh, I made a joke about the suffragettes in England. And uh, someone raised their hand and said, why do you always make jokes and uh, the butt of the joke are women? I said, I don't do that. And a voice said, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> and it was Armina who was <laughs> sitting in the class. And I was pulled up short. What did men, but what did feminism do, actually, once one took it seriously? Feminism was the most radical stream of constructivism. If you adopt the feminist view that gender is a, is a social and cultural construction, and it's the most generally naturalized category, right, then what happens to class? What happens to nation? Then everything's up for grabs. And that was not only a heady, but a totally destabilizing idea that one had to go through and accept. And I think I, I mentioned this last night in, with the Armenian part of this. Uh, we, we were not ready for that. Every undergraduate you now teach already is a constructivist, or at least they know that every con construct is socially, I mean, every concept is socially constructed. No, we didn't know that at first. And that was wonderfully good to teach people. And now you don't have to teach it. They come in with that already under the skin. And feminism was key to that evolution. So we have two, two more questions. Why was question, and then question. So my question was also about uh, the, the politics of this and sort of bringing together the two panels we've, we've heard today. Um, you, earlier, there was much discussion of how you were motivated, a whole generation of scholars were motivated to uh, 
to debunk the anti-communists, to debunk the liberal dismissal of the Russian Revolution, to, in a sense, to normalize uh, the, uh, the, the Bolsheviks themselves uh, and to uh, create a, a different and, and more sympathetic, to be honest, uh, examination of, of, of Soviet history. One of the, I think, after effects of the, um, uh, of the, all the turns of the 1990s was to inspire another generation of scholars uh, to use these tools to examine the Soviet Union and the communist countries themselves. And when that happens, and I think that uh, Golfo's presentation uh, really brought, brings this to light, when that happens, you begin really exposing uh, some of the horrors of, uh, of, of the Soviet Union and the way in which it, it becomes, in a sense, uh, I don't know, I don't want to use the word demonized again, but, but in a sense, we, we, we're using the critical tools of, uh, of really deconstructing the social categories in ways that bring out uh, a lot of the awful stuff that happened during the Stalinist years. Uh, and so I see, I, I see a sort of, uh, a sort of uh, uh, maybe it's an irony, uh, maybe it's a discomfort, that, uh, that this original goal of normalizing and, and viewing with more distance the Soviet experience turns back again to one in which that experience becomes quite uh, horrific. And then the political consequences of that are that once again, the, uh, the, the work a lot of us do end up feeding back into the liberal narrative that you were trying to challenge in, early in your career. I wonder if you could address that. That sounds exactly right, Brian. <laughs> That sounds exactly right. Because, so, you know, I dealt with the revolution and tried to, we tried to reformulate the understanding of the October Revolution because the dominant discourse at the time was that the October Revolution was a conspiracy, a coup d'etat uh, against the working class of Petersburg. This was a top-down understanding. And therefore, the regime itself was illegitimate from, from the beginning and could only survive through terror. There's a powerful truth to that argument, uh, you know, as well, if you, especially if you leave out the social history of things like the Civil War, the intervention, etc. And also, you have to bring in certain personal and ideological predilections of Lenin and the Bolsheviks, right? That ultimately, I mean, Leninism is not Stalinism, but Stalinism didn't come out of Buddhism. <laughs> it came out of Leninism. So, you know, it was always complicated. And how do you preserve, in the, during the Cold War and in the post-Cold War period, a kind of balanced view of the Soviet Union without apologetics? Because you'll always be accused of that, right? You're, there's no way around that. Uh, and also this kind of understanding. And as I said before, no matter what you do, ultimately Russia will do something like invade, you know, Ukraine, or shoot down an airline or whatever that will undermine those kinds of efforts. Uh, but you, you keep going on, and I'm always inspired by my, my friend Val, who can even tell you the good side of Alvin, Ivan the Terrible. I'm joking here, Val. So, but but there, there is, there's a way you can understand even the most despotic parts of, of Soviet history. Why was Stalin popular? How did he manage to rule? Terror alone? Or was there also inspiration and aspiration involved? And those are kinds of questions that certain kinds of historians would never have asked. And certain kinds of historians, as we know, Golfo, would go too far and, and try to, apo not apologize exactly, but over-explain Stalinism to the point that you did kind of marginalize some of the horrific aspects. When the archives open, you found out it was worse than anyone imagined. That it wasn't just show trials, intellectuals, party bosses. But it was masses of people who suffered in the 1930s, right? And then there's a swing that goes the other way, too far to, in my, you know, that the whole of the war is a genocide, that it was against, it was to eliminate Ukrainians. This will become another very powerful metaphor now that will be irre, irresistible to many people, right? Uh, and, and by the way, both sides are now accusing the other side of genocide in the current, there's no genocide. It's not genocide. It's war crimes. War itself is a war crime. But it's the, the bombing of civilians, aerial warfare, and all the rest of it. But there'll be an overreaction to these kinds of things. And historians, maybe not immediately, not in the 
public sphere, there'll be pundits and even academics who will do that, have to restrain themselves and wait until the moment becomes possible to look at these things in a more you know, complicated and hopefully uh, um, less, less uh, uh, engaged, not engaged, but fiery way. And so, so that's hard. Thank you, Ron. We're kind of at the end of our time. Should yeah, hang on one second. I think uh, Louis is going to join us quickly. Um, Louis, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask a question on yourself on the screen, that would be great. It's technologically oh, oh, Okay, I, I received a message about uh, postponing the question until later. Is that to be disregarded now? That is disregarded now. Okay. <laughs> So the, the question was really prompted by something Golfo observed. Um, and it, it, it's the difference between those of us who studied the Soviet Union while it was, um, to use a, a funny uh, locution, alive, uh, if not well, uh, and, those, and those who followed us. Um, and, and you know, really what difference it made to study the Soviet Union so long as it was, was in existence. Um, I've sort of pondered this question. I don't really have a good answer for it, except that, you know, the, the historical legitimacy of the Soviet Union um, remained in question, uh, especially in the, you know, sort of dominant liberal ideology with, with, in which we uh, existed. Um, and um, so is, is that what was going on? And of course, this applies as well to the East European um, so-called satellite countries as well. Can I ask whether you all were were just because I sense this as your student that that you that Ron and Sheila and Lewis and you, that you guys were a bit exhausted by the acrimony of the the field um, when there was a Soviet Union and that there was this desire at least I, I definitely sense this from Sheila this desire to just not go there again because it was these debates were so personal and so painful. That is true of Sheila, because Sheila's father was a kind of fellow traveler, uh, not, a, not a communist. And so she, from early life, and you can read her three autobiographies, uh, she actually suffered from that. And she was the target. Yeah. And she was brutally attacked and even suffered uh, employment on the basis of that. that. I cannot say <clears throat> that I ever suffered, except there was a moment when I was turned down for tenure at Oberlin College. Uh, the students revolted. Uh, and by the way, it wasn't liberals who supported me, but conservatives who understood that all views were somehow ideological. And I got my tenure, though never again any merit increases until I came to the University of Michigan. Thank you so much. I think um, we're out of time, but this was a great conversation. So thanks to our panelists and to all the organizers for helping this happen.